Hello, my name is Uwe Bergmann and I'm happy uh, for the opportunity to give uh, our talk at this uh, Zoom conference in Berlin. Uh, my topic today is how to conquer the data challenge at high repetition rate X-ray lasers. X-ray lasers have been around for about uh, 10 years now. Um, the first one in hard X-rays was built at SLAC National Accelerator Lab uh, run by Stanford University. You can see here a view of the whole facility including the long linear accelerator which houses uh, the X-ray laser. Um, the, these machines uh, provide ultra-fast, um, ultra-bright X-ray pulses which have really over the last uh, 10 years uh, revolutionized our science. Uh, I will give you a, a short overview of some of the capabilities and I will also show you um, the new upgrade of our X-ray laser to a high repetition rate. Uh, this upgrade will uh, change uh, the, pulse to rate, the pulse distance between uh, currently about 10 uh, milliseconds, so currently we have about 10 milliseconds so we can get 100 pulses per second. In the future we can go up to 1 million pulses per second. That uh, dramatic increase will also of course raise uh, the challenges for data. Um, here is an animation of the, how the, an X-ray laser works. Uh, we start uh, at the slack linear accelerator about 25 feet underground, 8 meters underground, where a optical laser ejects, uh, uh, hits a copper target and ejects electrons, um, about 10 billion at one shot, and then feeds them into the main accelerator um, area where these electrons are accelerated up to um, several um, giga electron volt all the way up to 15, between let's say 3 and 15. Um, once they have reached full energy, uh, these electrons uh, enter a, a series of undulators, which is a long uh, series of many, many magnets. In these magnets, uh, the electrons are accelerated sideways and create a, a wiggling motion, which uh, creates first synchrotron radiation. And as over time, uh, the intensity of that radiation builds up, they cause uh, amplified spontaneous emission of the electrons uh, in a lasing form. And it is this lasing which has really um, made a main difference uh, as compared to previously very powerful uh, synchrotron sources. Um, the electrons and X-rays travel together. The electrons are led by a big magnet into the ground and the X-ray pulses continue onto the experimental floor where at SLAC we have seven instruments and at each of those instruments uh, scientists perform their work. Um, what is important uh, to notice and what is an important difference uh, to previous uh, experiments is the fact that uh, these laser pulses are so intense that each of the experiments is in a sense, um, each of the shots of these laser shots uh, is its own experiment. When the idea of uh, LCLS and X-ray lasers was started, um, scientists were not sure what will happen to the sample. It's a big uh, problem, of course, because these X-rays are very, very intense. And there was an early work uh, in 2000 by uh, uh, Richard Neutze and, and Haidu and others uh, who estimated that uh, if you want to get an X-ray image uh, from a single shot on a biological molecule, after about, as you can see on the screen, after about 10, 20 femtosecond, bad things are starting to happen. And so the bottom line is you need to uh, get your image, um, your picture of the atomic structure or the electronic structure of what you want to study um, fast enough before, in this case it was a macromolecule, before it literally blows up from a Coulomb explosion. Uh, and I like, um, there is a very beautiful analogy to this. Uh, this is a photo taken 
1934 uh, in a book called Stopping Time. Uh, this was a book which uh, featured a lot of high resolution um, photos. And you can see this archer who has uh, just released his arrow and when he did so he had made a mistake. Uh, what what ha has happened is he didn't angle the bow in the correct way and you can see how the string of the bow is actually carving into his flesh. And I, I'm sure and in fact I have been told by some friends of mine who have been uh, uh, doing archery that this is extremely painful and it is actually more common than one might think. Um, the interesting thing about this shot, about this photograph, is that at the time this photograph was taken, uh, the archer was not aware. And so the pain had not reached his brain yet, because it takes some time. And you can, you can say this shot was taken before the sample was damaged or before the sample was destroyed. And for many systems studied with X-ray lasers, this is exactly the way how these experiments have to be performed. And here uh, I show you uh, an animation of that. This is basically uh, the photons coming from the left and the samples coming from the top uh, in an injector. And each shot, uh, although the shot destroys the sample, you hope that the scattering and the diffraction image is already uh, taken uh, and on its way to the camera uh, before damage occurs and that's how you can then um, solve the structure for example of proteins. Um, in, in a more realistic way uh, this is a system which uh, a collaboration I'm part of has developed it over the last uh, years. Um, in this particular system we study small crystals delivered in a, uh, in a liquid uh, on a drop, on a conveyor belt, we then expose these crystals to x-ray, uh, to first to optical light flashes and you can see here they are de deposed um, on a um, Kapton foil and then they are flashed. Uh, we create these transient states with these x-ray lasers and then uh, at a certain time later we zap them with the x-ray beam and create um, the x-ray diffraction and also we have a spectrometer to measure the electronic structure. So this is kind of, uh, for biological samples, this is kind of the idea of how these experiments are currently performed. Um, let me uh, show you a few challenges. Uh, one is that um, the, the spectra are not, um, uh, these pulses are not very clean, so they have a, a certain width about a half of a percent uh, of the um, of, of the energy. So if it's a 10 kV pulse, it's about something like um, 50 or so EV wide. Um, they also don't always arrive at the same time. So, they, so there's a little jitter uh, in the arrival time and they do have a little spatial oscillations as well. Uh, what that means is that you cannot, in many experiments, you cannot just average over many shots because a lot of information gets lost. You want to uh, you want to get um, all the information from each shot and if you have let's say a large uh, 2D camera for diffraction this could be this could mean more than a me megapixel of data uh, created um, at every single shot. Now with the current x-ray laser or the one which has just been um, used until about a year ago uh, that is a lot of data but it's still manageable. When we now go to the future uh, we need uh, um, better approaches. So let me uh, re show you now what the upgrade at uh, Slack uh, looks like in the future. Here again this is a picture of the um, Slack lab uh, looking towards the west. What you see in the background is actually those are the hills where the San Andreas Fault is below and behind those hills a little bit further is the Pacific Ocean. Now we are going to change around and we are going to look from the end of the accelerator uh, in the, uh, at the foothills uh, forward and this is how it looks and there's a new building uh, now at the beginning of this uh, linear accelerator. By the way in the, in the background if, you, if, uh, if the quality is good enough you can see the, um, some uh, hills and mountains. This is 
uh, basically looking towards Palo Alto and then across the bay behind San Jose, a little bit north of San Jose, those are these hills. Um, and uh, this new accelerator which we, are, uh, which we have now built and are currently starting to, to uh, get into use um, sits actually at the very beginning of, these, uh, of this large linear accelerator um, and uh, you can see uh, shown in red and white uh, called LCLS2 and then in the future there will be, it will be made a little bit longer into LCLS2 HE. You can see here uh, how they are, these are, uh, it's a cryo accelerator so that means it operates at liquid uh, helium temperatures and all of the accelerating units are inside this helium and here you can see um, an er early picture of the construction. Uh, here you can see now our new uh, undulator hall. This is, as I showed in this little video, this is where the x-rays, where the electrons are forced on this so-called slalom track where they create x-rays. And you can see we have now two, two of them. Uh, one to the uh, left is for soft x-rays. It's a, it a, has a horizontal polarization and one to the right is for hard x-rays and it, the magnets are horizontally so it has a vertical polarization. And uh, these are brand new and they are, we are just starting um, with COVID everything is a little bit delayed. We are just starting uh, slowly um, to kind of ramp it up and the plan is that in August we will start to do the very first uh, x-ray experiments with this, with this new setup. Uh, most important for my talk here is the fact that these uh, X-ray lasers, as I mentioned earlier, they have high repetition rate. While the original one has about uh, 10 milliseconds spacing, there is, a, there is a big one not too far from Berlin in, in Hamburg, which has these pulses where they, they have many pulses close together. And then you have, about, and then you have a long time uh, between them, so you have about 100 uh, or so a milliseconds time and then the, and the next uh, bunch train comes um, and, uh, and, and, and that setup has its own challenges because you get ma many data in a shot but then you have at least you have 100 milliseconds between these bunches of data where you can maybe read out your detector. Uh, with the new LCLS2 uh, we can space them up to a microsecond. We are probably not going to run at that uh, narrow spacing but, uh, but something like uh, 10 to 100 kilohertz, so which is 10 to 100 microsecond spacings. And so now think about it, you get, uh, you have a uh, several giga, uh, several megapixel image coming at a rate of 10,000 per second. So that's an enormous amount of data. And of course, the science opportunities for these um, with this new X-ray laser are also uh, tremendous because we can use now the, this high repetition rate that we can, in a day we can get something like 10 to the 10 uh, snapshots uh, and we can characterize heterogeneous samples. So th this, is, this is very important for material science but also for other systems. We can hope to capture some rare transient events uh, in, in chemical systems and we can, of course, and that's, the, the, that's really the dream is we can follow uh, these molecular changes and, and structural changes on the atomic level with 100 or uh, with 10 femtosecond resolution uh, or even a few femtosecond resolution uh, in, in operando, in, in systems which are uh, really performing the work. Um, you know, not to forget to say that they have to, if they are of uh, damaging nature, they have to be replaced, but that can that can be done as I showed. In some cases, in in some materials, you don't have to replace them, and so um, the techniques we are going to use are coherent diffractive diffractive imaging, uh, X-ray spectroscopy, and then various forms of X-ray um, imaging and scattering. Uh, generally speaking, uh, data uh, spectroscopies look at uh, electronic structure changes. Uh, where are the electrons? Are they, are they uh, in, a, in a? How do they change their orbitals? And then the more scattering techniques um, and fluctuation scattering and diffractive imaging—they look more at the structural changes of the whole um, 
material, let's say, uh, that does the uh, crystalline structure of a sample change and how fast does it change and how much does it change. Maybe there's a phase transition which you can initiate and then capture. Um, you, can, um, you need to have advanced computational approaches and data science. So you, you cannot just uh, collect all this data and then think you can uh, figure it out. You need to have um, sorting algorithms, machine learning approaches where you can very swiftly go through the data and um, by going through the data you can then select the useful shots, uh, discriminate the useful shots from the bad shots and uh, then hope to be able to re reduce this vast amount of data into some useful information. And um, I want, be before I show you some uh, uh, the general idea about material science, I want to also point out that uh, um, a very, very long dream has been to image biological function, so so-called biology in action if you want. And again, uh, we need to use the approach that we can probe the sample before it is damaged or destroyed and um, we need to uh, do that in the future under fu uh, on fundamental scales and also under functional conditions which I mentioned here. And the impact uh, of this could be, I mean, is really the hope is that you go beyond model complexes to large uh, uh, systems um, bio, in biological, like photolysis in biological and chemically relevant systems. And those can also be uh, relevant for, um, you know, making, for example, artificial uh, catalysts um, to capture, to, to split water or to, to use um, sunlight to create uh, a usable energy. Um, and uh, again, advanced computation and data science cannot be just a little addition to this. It has to become, it has to be an integral part of, of this effort. So um, you want to map reaction landscapes via diffusion maps, uh, manifold embedding and uh, related Bayesian approaches and you want to, uh, and, and that is really um, uh, still a holy grail. We, do, we, we don't know yet uh, how successful we will be in the future in that regard is you want to capture rare events. Um, and the reason why that capturing these rare events uh, is so important that we believe that in many um, large scale or natural occurring uh, systems um, these uh, the really critical mechanisms and the really critical occurrences and changes uh, chemical structural changes are can be rare events. So we need um, modern and advanced machine learning approaches. Uh, let me show you an, an example. This is from the internet and this line of work one of my colleagues from University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, Abbas Urmast, he's trying to use this um, approach also for x-ray work on x-ray lasers. And here you can see uh, the movie of an image uh, where you don't really recognize very much because you have uh, in these time random snapshots you have a very low signal to noise. Uh, in fact, um, you might have less than one photon per hundred pixels. And that could be similar to the situation we will face at X-ray lasers. In particular, if we don't have Bragg diffraction where, the, where you have a few very strong spots, but when we have a a non-periodic system or a biological system where the number of uh, uh, photons per pixel can be very very low. And um, what Abbas and others have been doing for many years now and I think even the big uh, some of the really very big high-tech companies um, when they talk about um, facial recognition and, and, and other approaches they have been uh, using these modern uh, image reconstruction um, approaches and also machine learning approaches to actually gain more information from these uh, very noisy shots. And this is the result when you when you do such an approach. Uh, in fact, this um, particular um, movie uh, was basically uh, an old movie of a ballerina and uh, it was 
the data quality was uh, artificially reduced and um, to, to what you see in the first movie and then using this approach um, the question was asked can you get back more information and the and the answer is yes what you wouldn't be able to do in this reconstruction is to tell whether the ballerina is actually turning clockwise or counterclockwise uh, because that that has uh, in the image reconstruction that has a similar um, is basically the as, as same result um, and um, to, to before I finish um, what we do, want to do in material science and I'm part of a center um, together with colleagues from USC uh, in Southern California Rice University and others we want to use uh, these ultra fast x-ray lasers to study um, advanced uh, 2d materials and here uh, uh, here you see a picture. You, you basically create um, an excitation with, uh, with an optical pulse where you create um, some holes uh, in the valence band and then create some um, extra electrons in the conduction band and uh, uh, the, uh, the band gap could be of order 1 eV or so and that uh, corresponds to an optical excitation and by doing that uh, you can um, th then what you do is you use X-ray spectroscopy and X-ray laser to see how uh, the dynamics of these um, electrons and of the holes, how the di dynamics and the interplay of the dynamics happens. And you can, f you can really track that on the time scale of a few femtoseconds. So that's your time resolution. And these, these things, they happen in, typically they happen within a picosecond. Uh, after after a few picoseconds, the main effect you will see is heating. But before that, you can really you can really measure um, um, these dynamics, and that will help you uh, in the future to design uh, opto electronic devices, which you can then. I mean, that is really the dream in the future that you can use light uh, rather than a magnetic field. Uh, you use uh, light to control these devices, to make them faster, to make them smaller, and to make them more efficient. And um, we think that um, a free electron X-ray laser and machine learning uh, together uh, will provide an extremely powerful combination to study these things. So then let me um, finish uh, by summarizing. Uh, there are dramatic advances in computational capabilities and advanced algorithms coupled with massive data sets um, uh, required and they create a profound opportunity for data science um, and we have that we have now we are about to get uh, the big microscopes these x-ray lasers at high repetition rates amazing machines very powerful machines we are going to be able to perform the experiments and we are going to need the data science uh, to, to make the best out of it. And it is not simply just doing the same faster and on a larger scale. We really have to think outside the box to come up with really new uh, ways of doing it. Um, and um, I should, should point out that um, th these methods will of course uh, accelerate other fields as well. And we do need your help. Uh, we need the help of people who have thought about these things and might have similar problems and we need to work together. And I want to thank you uh, also for your attention. Uh, let me finish by also thanking my colleagues. Um, Bob Shainline, he's the Deputy Director of the LCLS and he has provided me some of the... Uh, I've been a long collaborator with him for many years and he has provided me some of those slides. Uh, Andrew Atta uh, in the middle, he, he is my research associate, uh, ju just about to finish up. Um, and uh, he has done some beautiful work on 2D materials, uh, which we're still, you know, we're still doing the data analysis. And then Mike Dunn, who is the director actually of LCLS, and he has provided me, uh, we have been you know, working together for many years, and he has also provided me uh, with some of those beautiful uh, recent images of LCLS too. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.